you want to get rid of that message? Have you got a message on there? Uh, yeah, it's it's gone. It's cool. gone. We're good. All right, cool. Well, hello, lovely listeners. Um, today I have the wonderful Corby Mitlide uh, on. Uh, we just had a discussion about how to pronounce her surname. Corby is, um, well, she, she's self-proclaimed the different one and um, a writer, a visionary, although from a very um, traditional medical family, um, she's al always made her own way in life and even left a, a very high proclaimed university after a couple of years to try and find her own joy and purpose. Um, not an easy uh, path by all accounts. I'm, I'm intrigued to hear your journey, Corby. And, um, and she is now a tarot master, psychic medium, past life specialist and channel, which is right up my street. Um, I have a few cards myself. I always like the idea of being a channel. Um, I love Abraham Hicks, uh, although I haven't listened to her for ages. Um, so yeah, and um, and lots of things. And the other thing is, she used to live in Poughkeepsie, and my family live in Poughkeepsie. So um, I'm uh, I'm I'm uh, very happy about that. So welcome, Corby. It's an absolute honour to have you on. Thank you so much. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for asking. Ah, oh, no problem. Um, so Corby, I I want to know. Um, more about you. I want to know what it was like growing up in a quite a traditional based occupational, I guess, traditional occupational family um, and how that felt and, and how you sort of then struck out. Because I know you've been married a couple of times as well and, and um, they didn't work out. So I'd love your backstory and I'd love and I really want to know more about the work you do now. So over to you. All right. Let me see how much of the 30 second elevator speech you need versus <laughs> the backstory. Um, my family was very, very dysfunctional. My mother was an alcoholic cross addicted with barbiturates. Uh, so it was environmentally and emotionally very, very toxic. Um, dad was a doctor, mom was a nurse, my brother is a doctor. And I knew when I was nine, there was magic in the world and I wanted to go find it, courtesy of a book called The Witch Family by Eleanor Estes. So I was always the one who was left of center. I was a writer. I was a theater major, even in high school. And, you know, they would be talking about, you know, this doctor that screwed up at the hospital and this nurse that messed up the meds. And you wonder why today I don't like hospitals. Yeah. I could have stood on the table and tap danced and recited Shakespeare and nothing. Um, I also had a mother who was who had a very bad self-image. And so she spent her life telling me everything that was wrong with me right. and why no one would want me and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you talk toxic. Um, but I could not fit myself into the mold they wanted. My brother went to my uh, father's college, his medical school, we both adored my father, but my brother and I are kind of like a Rorschach of him. My brother is the brilliant, incisive physician. He's world famous in his field. His patients adore him. But me, I'm the one who looks at the spiritual behind the physical. I'm the writer, and my father was a, a wonderful writer. He and I were best friends. We had the same birthday, RJ. Mm -hmm. So... I went literally from job to job to job to job to job when I left Brown University after two and a half years. Um, the two marriages were to people in a Renaissance and medieval reenactment group that uh, it's worldwide. It's called the Society, Society for Creative Anachronism. But of course, when you marry Duke Gavin, you forget Peter comes along with it. Yeah. And so... It was always fine when we were you know, swanning around in our odd clothes, but reality didn't work. And so I kept trying to find out who I was, how to appreciate who I was, and how to make it work without lying. I mean, career, actress, author, inspirational speaker, video producer, legal assistant, writer for a graphic novel series, executive recruiter for engineering and manufacturing. I was never out of a job but I would get fired because I wouldn't fit 
the usual subservient mold that was expected. Now, in 1973, when I was a senior in high school, I got my first tarot deck. I was working at a shop called Spencer Gifts and they had the James Bond 007 tarot deck and I bought it because in 1973, we were all hippies. You had your elephant bell bottoms and your fringe jacket in your deck. Five years later, everyone else had moved on to roller skates and disco balls. I was still reading the cards because I found them fascinating and I was getting stories that they would tell. So for 20 years, I read for friends, always keeping my ego out of it and being a clear channel for the information that came through. All of a sudden in 1994, I could do hands-on healing and talk to dead people with no training. That's basically when the universe handed me my draft notice and said, hello, you're working for us. But I did it part-time. I always had the other job to bring in money. Can I, can I just quickly interrupt? What, can you remember the first time that, that actually happened? Which? Firing of the cards. <laughs> the, the, they're talking to dead people with the cards. You said it was part, but can you, was there one sort of moment that? Um, it was occurring. I think in 1994, I was doing some past life um, work with um, a friend in Colorado, lost touch, don't even know where she is. And we had picked up a life in World War I for me that we, without having any background, knew what was going on. We saw a vision and then we would look up a book it, from 1898 and find out boom, 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 boom. We were getting it absolutely right. And it was at that time that I began to speak to those who had passed over during World War I. Um, as far as talking to, can you call them modern dead people? <laughs> that started when I hung my shingle out shortly afterwards. Um, I can do mediumship. I'm pretty good at it, but it's not my favorite thing. It's like a doctor has a specialty. Mm. My specialty are the cards, Oracle as well as tarot now, and past lives. Okay. When I work with dead people, at least now, I do not go fish because I find it too easy to fool you. I see a woman in a flowered dress handing you a rose. It's your grandmother and she loves you. Oh, can I please? No. So I get what I call their dog tags. For instance, my father, Jerome Richard Dorkin, who died in 2001 at the age of 80. Notice tells me nothing, but gets me into the energy. And what my guides do is it's almost like charades. They smoked. They had an accident. They had surgery. I don't know where this came from, but this is just how my guides work. So that I get real specifics about people. Two examples. A woman who wanted to speak to her father-in-law. I felt myself miming a pool cue. He had taught her how to play pool. When I was reading in Canada, there was a woman who wanted to speak to her grandfather. And I find myself saluting. Now, in America, we salute with our palm down. Brits and Canadians, of course, palm out. He was acknowledging that she had just graduated two weeks ago from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Academy and he was celebrating with her. That's not, it's a rose, she loves you. Mm -hmm. That's how specific I want to be. But spirit, spirit works with us, rifling through our file cabinet to see what we've got to play with. Why do I do past lives? Why do I do tarot? As an actress, I know how to develop a character. As a writer, I know how to tell stories. And I have been a history crazy person since I was a youngster. So that's why you have two of us doing a past life with you. Someone else might say, well, it's a long skirt and a big hat in front of a very ornate building. So I know this is old fashioned. I can see it and say, hobble skirt, picture hat, that kind of uh, an ostrich feather. And you're in front of the Brandenburg gate. So I think this is Berlin in 1911 or 12. Which one's going to give you more information? So this past life stuff, I've, I've been through, I've had it done a couple of times and I've seen, mm -hmm. th I've seen things. Um, mm -hmm. How did that come about? Did that just naturally just start to happen? <clears throat> well, yes and no. 
my past lives hit me. And then I realized I was able to get them again for those three reasons. The first one that I remember, this was back in the 80s. And um, I'm not someone who is madly and you know, for rock stars groupies. I'm not. But I was obsessed with the lead singer of a rock group from Philadelphia in the 1980s. Couldn't figure out why. But as we started doing some past life information, we got my backstory. We got everyone around us. We were still trying to figure out who this person was. Working with a friend. And I remember we were sitting in a restaurant and I was eating linguine and clams on it. And all of a sudden in my head, boom, Marcus Barron Gordon Huntley. Now, remember, I'm an American. I don't know what this two title stuff is. In college, my secondary major was Tudor England. I know nothing about this. But what do you do when you've got titles you don't understand? You go to Debrett's peerage. And I knew this was somewhere around 1783 or four. I find that there is, born in 1752, Alexander, 12th Marcus of Huntley. And in 1784, he was made Baron Gordon of Huntley. Wow. What are the odds? <laughs> but the interesting part is once I slotted him into the storyline and realized what the message was, which was he wasn't mine then and he's not going to be mine now, except it, the obsession went away. Popped like a soap bubble. Who, who's the band? Nope. Not going to tell you. <laughs> not going to tell you. <laughs> Um, they're still around that much. I will tell you and they're far more popular in Europe and Japan than they are in America. In America, it's where are they now kind of thing. Oh, okay. Um, the other huge past life for me was something I discovered at the Rhinebeck Aerodrome in Rhinebeck, New York in around 1991. Up until that point, I knew nothing about World War I because I was raised into Jewish family, my family, you know, Nazis, Germans, all Germans are horrible. And so I was terrified even to hear the language. So the old Rebeck Aerodrome is a wonderful literal flying museum. And I went with, at that point, my second husband and he wanted to go, I just wanted to go visit Woodstock, which is right near it. So we watched the American planes and the British planes and the French planes and the Italian planes. And then all of a sudden there was an Albatross D5 followed by a Fokker triplane. That's the Red Baron's plane that Snoopy always fights. And there was a soundless explosion in my head that said, I flew those and there's a story behind it overnight. I had to know everything about World War I. I needed to speak the language. I looked at books of pilots and this one I couldn't stand and this was my best friend, and, and, and. So we unraveled that past life as well. That's when I realized that if you find a past life and you find out what the trip trigger is from that, that you're learning in this life, you can heal a lot of things. Right. And the way some people can do a mediumship gallery, you know, grabbing your dead Aunt Mary in 30 seconds. I can very often do that in a past life gallery. There was a woman who said to me, I'm really obsessed about the Underground Railroad and I have nothing to do with it. And I don't live anywhere near it. For those that don't know the Underground Railroad during the time of the American Civil War is how slaves were brought from the South to freedom in the North. And it was dangerous and it was secret, but literally thousands of lives were saved. So I closed my eyes. I immediately told her what I was seeing. There is a small whitewashed room. Ceiling is rather low. In fact, there are two tall gentlemen who are standing by a rickety iron bed and their heads are bent because that's how they have to fit in the room. 
you're kneeling by the bed, the clothing you're wearing is about 1862 or three, it's a gray serge dress, and you've got black soutache around the peplum and the sleeves and the hem. In the bed is a very old wizened black woman who is dying and all of you are very, very regretful because she was this close. It, it's, you're in Philadelphia, she needed to get to Boston and she was going to die before she got there to her family and to freedom. And I opened my eyes and the woman has tears pouring down her face and says, I've had that dream for 20 years repeatedly and never knew what it was. Wow. But that's not me. As John Holland, a very well-known medium Holland. says, yeah. we're the tube kids. It yeah. is not your power. We are only the tube. Amazing. Do, how do you... Um... How does it how does it happen for you? Like I've always been intrigued by this as a medium mm -hmm. or a, a psychic or whatever. Do you see stuff for everyone that you meet, or is it just no, 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 no? No, no. no I have an agreement with my guides that I'm like a shop. I have an open sign and a closed sign. The reason why I do it that way, very specifically, is people are scared of us because they think we're magic and that we are prying in their heads. One of the worst things in the world is what I call a drive-by psychic shooting. And on the <laughs> Long Island medium, they show it all the time. People are shopping at Wegmans grocery store. And she walks up to somebody and says, excuse me, you're Aunt Doris. She says, you have a bull tire in the back and you're gonna die in an accident if you don't get it fixed in a week. Just telling you when she walks away. <laughs> Number one, that's not how it works. Her scouts go and look at all of the Wegmans grocery stores on Long Island and pick one. Then they interview people and get them to sign a model release. And then it is um, filmed six times till they get it right. But there are people who think that's legitimate. That's like you're at a cocktail party and you see your OBGYN and you casually mention you have this problem and he lifts your skirt. I'm sorry, you didn't ask and it's the wrong venue. Um, so I tell people when that happens, you just stop them right there. No, I don't want the information. I don't know you, I don't trust you. And if they keep following you, you report them to the management because that's harassment. Mm. And you know, it's the same thing, unfortunately, with healers who don't know any better. For 18 years, I was on the psychic circuit here in the East Coast of the US, 45 weekends a year on the road. My nickname was the Travel Channel. And sometimes you get a headache and the, these healers, you know, little dancing porcupine or whatever her name is would go, oh, I can fix that for you. And I would say, no, no, really I can. And I had to back up and stab at them. I said, no. And then they go, you're not very love and light, are you? <laughs> it's called boundaries. But you know, that is why I wrote this. This is the Psychic Yellow Brick Road, how to find the real wizards and avoid the flying monkeys. And I wrote it because a lot of people, well, let's put it this way. A lot of people love going to art museums, but they don't want to learn to paint. Mm -hmm. A lot of people really love having intuitive assistance, but they don't want to learn how to develop their psychic abilities. That book keeps them safe. Tells them what we can do, what we can't, how to ask the questions, what some of the skills are. And I don't care if people never come to me after they read that book. If they are safe going to any psychic, then all boats rise. And maybe that's, that's different. I know that most books like that are written with a subtext and I'm the only one you should go to. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. There are 8 billion people in the world now, petunias. I can't read them all. If I could get you to see another psychic who's good, oh, please do. <laughs> you know? So sort of backtracking a little bit. Um, yeah. You left uni early. Um, you were finding, trying to find your way. <laughs> you ended up in two marriages. Just tell us a little bit about you the person as opposed to you the psychic or the the, the past life you know in terms of what sure. did, what did that look like for you through those marriages and how did they 
start and end? Well, <clears throat> the first one started with uh, a normal Jewish wedding, the wedding my mother never got to have. Uh, but we broke up in less than a year because we were so woefully mismatched, really were. Um, first time I got hit, I left. 12 years later, uh, a nice guy, both of us had been around the block so many times, we figured we owned the block and we got married as friends. We figured that's enough. Two years later, he said, I don't like being married. I don't like sharing my money. So I'm going to California, you're not invited. Leaving me in Atlanta. And as I will tell people, I am not a Magnolia kids. I'm a bagel. I belong in New York. Um, the third guy was the right guy. Instead of a bad biker boy type, he was like Father Mulcahy on the television show MASH. He is uh, honest. He's frugal. He's kind. He's funny. He's monogamous. And we've been married now for 20 years. How and did, how did you meet him? At the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. Both of us love World War I aviation. And as he said, there was this gorgeous brunette who knew the difference between a Fokker DR1 and an F1 based on the wings because I had to marry him. Now, <laughs> that was in 2002. 2004, I had had cancer twice before. Yeah. And I got my third, uh, my second primary in 2004. And the doctor said, okay, three strikes, you're out. We're taking the rack. We're also taking the ovaries to cut your hormones. And you're going from a literal Dolly Parton figure to a fat fire plug with permanent side effects in three weeks, suck it up. Nice. The first two guys never would have stayed. The third one looked at me and said, am I gonna miss them? Oh yeah, they were gorgeous, but I married you, not them. It completely changed the marriage we thought we were going to have. It's always been a work in progress, but I think that we love each other more now than we did 20 years ago because we've known marriage has to be a 60-60 proposition. Each one goes a little bit more than halfway and it's the extra 10% that locks it in the tough times. Wow. Um, just out of curiosity, you obviously, you know, three times cancer, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you went down the Western medicine route in terms of what happened to the body. Did, did, does that suit you as a person? Because I, I always have this probably stereotype, which is wrong, but anybody that's spiritual and, and that way inclined would be I'm more belt and suspenders. I yeah. am belt and suspenders. Remember, I did come from a medical family. Yeah. Um, and the doctors I had were generally pretty good. So here's your example. 1989, I was acting in New York and that's when I had my first bout. It was lumpectomies and radiation. I was, I mean, it was the typical actress life. 60 hours a week at a job to make money, classes at the Actors Institute, rehearsals, auditions. Well, at the Actors Institute, I had a teacher. Her name is Twyla, and she worked with us with visualizations. And very fashionable in those times was visualize your cancer, and it's a dragon, it's a nasty, and then you've got your white blood cells, and it's St. George, blah, blah, blah. That wasn't the way I saw mine. When I visualized my cancer cells, they were apple green and fuzzy. And they had big feet and big eyes and antenna and they were crying. And I said to them, why are you crying? They said, nobody loves us because we're different. So my visualization was to pull them all on my lap on a sofa like puppies and love them until they were pink again. That's the spiritual way of doing it. Also, I know exactly why from a spiritual point of view, I got the cancer. Okay. And that was, in my pre-birth plan. This is a, a soul that usually comes in 80, 20, 80% male, 20% female. My tough lives are my female lives. And when I'm a male, I don't value females very much. And I see them only as the body, that's their worth. That's how my mother was 
had a very important part to play in at age 16, she presented me with either I can show her I'm worth more than my body or believe what she said, which is where I went and had 30 years of hell because no self-respect, thought I was never allowed to say no to anything. Okay. So the first two bouts, radiation surgery, no chemo, thank God. The reason why the third one was a primary, which brings the danger clock back to zero. Basically, my higher self, my guides were saying, look, we need you down there to teach. You haven't been able to get past the rack mentally, so we're going to remove the problem. All right. Um, because of my attitude, I knew that, did I go home and cry for 24 hours? Of course, I'm normal. Yeah. But I knew that I needed to find three reasons to be okay with it to switch things around for me. Didn't care how stupid they were. So number one, if you don't have them, you can't get cancer there, this is good. Number two, the top half is not gonna get slammed in the refrigerator door at the doctor's every year for the exam and every woman listening knows exactly what I'm talking about with that. Third, implants, I'll be perky till I'm 93, this is cool. <laughs> I was able to walk out of a six hour operation, double mastectomy reconstruction, walk out of Massachusetts General Hospital in three days, shopped for a bathing suit in five, here I am at almost 67, clean, clear. This is what it can be like. Today, if you look at me, there is no way you can imagine me the way I used to be. Mm. I almost can't imagine it. I am completely comfortable where I am. And I teach with it. It is called living the examined life. This is happening and I cannot change it. What's the lesson? For me specifically, because I am a teacher by nature, how can I teach with it? Next. A lot of women who have cancer, that's the first thing they tell you when you meet them, even if it's been 15 years ago. I don't tell people, yes, I wore a blue checkered dress to my senior prom in high school. I did, but it's not who I am. Mm. The cancer happened, but it's not who I am. I pull it out when I can teach with it. But other than that, it doesn't affect me. Mm, I like that. I like that. So, on a slightly self indulgent question, um, indulging you or me? In me. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, I, you know, I, I have certain things that happen for me, like I see auras, I have out of bodies. Um, I see things in the third eye or whatever. I do Reiki, mm -hmm. but, and I've, and I've always been different. As you said, you were from a young age, but um, I was in the spiritual closet for a long time um, before I felt brave enough to come out. And I had a, a wonderful yoga teacher that helped me with that. Okay. And I've, I've always wanted to, I've always had this like notion that I want to, I want to be able to be more, um, psychic I want to be able to you know I've got cards and stuff but I don't I'm not intuitive with them at all um I'm reading the book I'm trying to figure you know I'm trying to get the message from the, the pictures or whatever uh, and it's not quite coming and that's probably because I haven't spent enough enough time with it but what would you um sort of recommend to anybody that sort of feels like that that they want to develop this sort of um ability if you like we've all got it but we just don't mm -hmm. do anything with it right um what would you sort of recommend and and that, that was why I was kind of keen earlier when I asked you you know what was your first moment of realizing you could talk to dead people or whatever mm -hmm. um you know what space were you in when that sort of happened uh I was very much interested in uh, the past lives stuff we we all come at it from different directions mm -hmm. When you really know yourself, you know what to use. Um, don't ever ask me to use a pendulum or do spirit art. Number one, I had a slight benign tremor in one hand, kind of like Catherine Hepburn. So I could never trust what I'd get on a pendulum. And as far as spirit art goes, I can't draw a stick figure with a sharp pencil and a lot of prayer. <laughs> Not gonna happen. But because I love telling stories, 
I love artwork. I mean, when I went to London years ago, my thing, I, I spent hours at the National Portrait Gallery trying to figure out the person behind the eyes. I love that. Um, so for me, artwork and the cards is good. You got to work with what you love. Mm. And also, because I'm a storyteller, the cards tell stories for me. Now, remember, I'm a certified tarot master because I've been reading them for almost 50 years now. Right. So someone who's only been reading for two years, no, you're not going to have the same oomph. Don't worry about that. But it's one of the reasons why I tell people, go taste everything you want, but don't try to learn everything you want. Something will go ding. For people who just want to learn how to open up the roadways for this, I'm going to go off camera for 15 seconds, but I am still here. I'm just pulling something off my list because this is the book that I recommend to everybody. Opening to Channel by Sanaya Roman and Dwayne Packer. It's been around for 35 years. It's how I learn. Remember, my family is not into this. No. So it's not like I'm a seventh generation in <laughs> okay? And what I explain to people is we are all wired like the same houseplant. We all have 10 fingers, right? All of us can sit down at the piano and pick out chops, chopsticks with a little effort. There are some of us who love the idea of music. And so we learn how to read it, we practice, we get pretty good. I'd say I'm there. One in 20 million is Elton John. Yeah. But we all have 10 fingers. So that's one of the things that I want to remind people. You can do what I do. I'm not special. But you need to find what you love. And then you will find it's almost effortless. It's also, um, if you will, bedside manner. When I do spiritual expo, psychic fair, there are what, 30, 40, 100 of us? How do people know they want to talk to me? Mm. It's attitude. If you want someone, like I say, who is glurpy purple with angels, very soft, very sweet. Hello, my name is Little Dancing Butterfly. And today we're going to talk to your angels. You're not going to come to me, honey, <laughs> because I'm the New Yorker. I will hit you upside the head with a clue brick. Here are your opportunities and how to grab them. Here's the tough stuff. Here's how to get through it or around it. Here's your toolbox, go rock and roll. But both of us are completely valid readers. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of who do you resonate with, just like a doctor with a bedside manner. So that's why you start. You realize it's going to take you some time to rev your motor. That is perfectly fine. You do not have to become expert at everything. Don't do it because you think you have to. You got to love it. There is a magnificent young adult fantasy series that uh, I love. It's the Young Wizard series by Diane Duane. And in there is the line, magic does not live in the unwilling heart. And that's the point. If you think you have to learn this or you're not good, you will never do it. Mm. If you say, I love these cards or look at these crystals, I could fall into them. Let's see how we can play together. Then the energy reaches out to you and says, hot puppies. Yeah, let's do this. That so don't sense. beat yourself up about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, how did your family feel about what you do? Well, my father kind of understood uh, what I was because he and I were those best friends. His nickname for me was Old Fay, F-E-Y. Um, and three weeks after he died, he showed up in my living room. And after crying for 30 seconds, I looked at him and screamed, I told you. Because I used to say to him, Dad, trust me, 
you got to go upstairs, sign the guest register, unpack your bags, get the orientation tour, and we'll talk. Could you um, actually see him? Could you actually see him? I saw a heat shimmer, and it was right here, and I felt dead. Right. Felt. I mean, you know, we all have signatures. You know, it, I'm willing to bet if you had three of your best friends and you closed your eyes and they moved around, you'd still be able to tell by the energy, that's Betsy, that's Josh, that's Adam. Yeah. Okay. To this day, my brother will not tell people what I do. He will not discuss my business with me. He tells people I'm a motivational speaker. And it's taken me decades, but I have finally accepted. He will never value what I do or who I am at core. It's okay. Um, I told him what I did in 2005 because there were a lot of expos I wanted to do in the New England area, which is where he is. And he and I are cookie cutters. You can tell we're brother and sister. And I didn't want anyone walking up to him and saying, hey, I saw your sister doing blah, blah, blah. So I told him and he looks at me for about 30 seconds and he says, well, shrimp. I'm his little sister. I guess if it's not illegal, then that was it. <laughs> um, He's as dry as you then. Oh, I'm not dry. <laughs> We're both funny. We're both funny. I mean, I've done stand-up comedy about what it's like to be a psychic these days. Oh, wow. I have. The, the perfect example I'll give you is the what drives all of us psychics crazy is the client that knows what they want to hear and will be it on us until they do does bruce love me no is he gonna love me not the way you think well if i do such and such is he gonna love me no well is he gonna call soon no he's not well if he's not gonna call soon he's gonna call and boom 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 hoping that you will finally go yes yes he loves you and he wants seven babies with you but he just doesn't know that yet oh good i knew that i can i, I can relate to that from the younger yeah. me yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's you know but those are the kind of stories that people laugh at which is why I said yeah I can do a seven minute stand up on <laughs> but one of the things one of the skills again storyteller there are three cards that weird out rookies death the devil and the tower and I make sure when I talk to them, that I explain, you have to look at the allegory. All right, so here's the tower card. Yeah. People think that's doom, gloom, and destruction, and it looks pretty bad. But I look at them and I say, I want you to think of this as the imploding sports stadium card. You're the UK, so I'll use soccer. Watford wants to build a new stadium. They have to tear up the old one first and clear the ground. Yeah. Okay. And when they hear that, they're not nearly as scared of it. Eight of Swords. Yes, it looks very scary and she's blindfolded and she's bound and she's surrounded by swords, but look very carefully. The bindings are loose. If she is willing to shrug them off, look forward and move under her own power Notice the swords are not pinning down her skirt. She can walk free. Mm -hmm. That is easier to tell people than, yeah, it's all scary out there, but you can fix this. Yeah. People need stories. Um, why, why have bards been so famous and minstrels? They tell us the stories we need to know, which is one of the reasons why a good intuitive doesn't tell fortunes. I am not a madam hoo-ha. I am not. Uh, a Swami Swalanda. I will give you a deep dish reading. I have 11 cards that I will read for you. If you want to start a business, I will not say, wait until January and fire the redhead. It's a card for you, a card for the energy around the business, the brick and mortar location, how to market it, clients, competition, staff, finances, what you need to know and best possible outcome. Which is why my clients know, don't ask me yes or no questions. If you say, is my business going to be successful? I will look at you and say, and what if I said, no, you're going to lose everything and live in a box under a bridge? Wrong question. Yeah. Ask, how do I make the business rock and roll? 
This is also one of the reasons why I have clients that have come to me literally for 17 years because I get them to look at their own possibilities. I remind them that, you know, I am not a psychic who says her aura don't stink and it's only me. And I empower them to go and live their lives, find their sentence of passion and make a difference in the world. That's just who I am. That's why, again, it's opened and closed. I don't need to show off to anybody. Mm. I'm an elder now. You come to me for answers, I will do my best for you. But I don't feel the need to push. In fact, I lost a reality show over this. This close to the contract was already written. And they said, and you know, we'll tell people, nobody can do what you do, blah, blah. I said, no, you can't do that. That puts a lie to everything I've ever taught. They said, oh, well, then we don't want you. I don't like reality shows anyway. I think they're hilarious. Um, there was, you know, Ghost Hunter show. My husband used to run a eight building Revolutionary War Museum. And so uh, one of the big Ghost Hunter shows went to film there. And it was so patently false. You know, they're supposedly from New England. All the fans were from California and they slapped Rhode Island plates on them. And they said, well, they can't be anything up on the second floor. It must be pigeons and rats fighting. Do you know how many of our docents and the people who work there have heard voices and screams and footsteps? So no, they're all fake. They're all fake. Reality show is an oxymoron, yeah. like jumbo shrimp. Yeah, yeah. So. Absolutely. So, so obviously you did a lot of, like you said, expos and traveling and, and mm -hmm. that's how people would find you. What's, yep. what, what does life look like now? Do you just have regular clients? Do you still do that sort of thing? Well, you know, we're all living through the years of murder hornet bingo and hold my beer. Um, but that's another examined life thing with the universe. Uh, in the summer of 19, uh, 2019, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, herniated discs, disc, pinched nerves. That makes having triplets look like a tea party baby, let me tell you. Um, it took me about four months to get relatively normal again, but the doctor said, look, we're sorry, but your career is toast. You can no longer do the 10 hour drives. You can no longer load in and load out all your heavy equipment. That was in November of 2020, and I scrambled to make my business completely online. What happened, or excuse me, 2019, then March of 2020, COVID hit. All of my friends who were still just on circuit, their business tanked. My last two years have been as good or as better as they ever were on the road. And frankly, today it's in the low 20s Fahrenheit. There's snow on the ground. It's blustery. And normally I would be on the road to Canada for my first show of the year. Right. I'm sitting here talking to you with a cup of coffee and my cats are snoozing on the cat tree. <laughs> I like this better. Yeah. <laughs> Besides, when I was on the road, I was in my 40s and 50s. Yeah. The body does slow down in the 60s. So I'm very happy to give everything I know about that to the next generation, which is why I wrote my third book, You've Got the Magic Who Needs a Gene, to give them everything I learned, including some of the tough stuff. I always tell people, you've got to have a sign-in sheet where your client writes their name and their birthday and et cetera. Why? Because there was someone I read in London, Ontario, 15 years ago. He was a young man, did not like what I told him. The next day, there was an anonymous death threat on my booth table, wow. handwritten. But because I had my sign-in sheets, we were able to match up the writing, turn it over to the Ontario police and they took it from there. Really, wow. You don't think about those things when you're just starting this. Mm. But that's the kind of stuff that I remind people of in the book, how to choose the fares, how to dress, how to do your booth, how to choose your front person, how to work with colleagues. It is a business. And yeah. if you can mount the, straddle the twin mountains of what I call business acumen and wiki woo, you can make a living at this. 
very well and very honestly. You don't have to be, oh, magic cutter, $600 candle, I can fix. No, we don't go there. Corby, if, um, so you, you teach people how to do this, but you still have obviously clients that are asking you questions about life, business, and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. So how, yeah. do, how do people find you if they want to come and have a reading or, or work with oh, you? Oh, Mel, Mel, they can't avoid me. They really yeah. can't. <laughs> Number one, they go to my website, corbymidline.com. There's uh, 15 different readings there. There's 150 articles for you to read, uh, links for my books, things like that. You can find me on YouTube and Pinterest and Instagram and Twitter, Corby Midline. On Facebook, Fire Through Spirit. That's my if you will, spiritual information page and where I do my free reading hours once a month. And if you want to work with me on a regular basis, learning how to do some of this stuff, um, exploring lots of different things, I'm on Patreon. And uh, there are several tiers. One of them, you get together with me once a month with what I call the nest. Right now, there are about 10 other people, a uh, different one. You get together once a month and four times a year, I teach private classes for you. Because I love Patreon. Patreon is a way for people who are really serious about, I wanna work with you to do it without having to worry about committing to a six year class or thousands of dollars. So I reach out to people as, as well as I can in as many forms as I can so that I can do for them what they want and need. It's not just one thing. Yeah. Cool. Um, I've never heard of Patreon. I'll have to. I'll have to have a look at that. So Patreon, Patreon is. If you haven't, do it. It's yeah. Even you with a podcast, because it is a platform where people can support the artists and the creators that they love. P a t r e o n dot com. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll check that out. Um, Corby, it's been a real, it's been a real delight to meet you. I mean, re reading your your bio, I had a sense of the personality, but um, the personality is even bigger than I expected. And um, I, uh, yeah, and um, you know, your story is is amazingly inspirational as well with everything you've been through. And uh, and I'm so pleased that you've been in a very happy twenty year marriage as well, um, with a wonderful man by the sounds of it who who's completely got your back so um I like to finish these conversations with however you want to finish it whatever comes up for you for anybody that might be listening that's drawn to you what would you like to say I'd be delighted to work with you it's always an honor but I'm going to give you a takeaway that you don't need me for Mm -hmm. and that is to find your sentence of passion as I did your sentence of passion is not who you are or what you do or even how you do it it's your vapor trail when you go skidding into heaven on ball tires and fumes in the tank and God hands you a pint and says so you get to tell him I did this and for me that's cross the bridge from fear to fearlessness and fly when I can take you from point a to point b when you thought you couldn't make it tap you on the shoulder and say, here are your wings. You don't need a flight plan now, get. I'm living my bliss. And if you can find your bliss that way, anything that you want to do in the unusual realm, whether it's costume design or psychic work or anything, you'll know what you're here to do and you can't and won't let anyone stop you from doing it. That's how you make sure you never settle. Yeah, wow. Beautiful, thank you. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you again. Um, and I hope I'll pass across again at some point. Thank you, Corby. I'd love it. You're welcome. Good to talk to you. You too.